Hey, I'm Pastor Andrew Ebanks, lead pastor at the Agape Family Worship Center. We pray this message and resource will stir up your affections for Jesus and encourage you in your calling. Use this resource in conjunction with you belonging to a local church that is helping to shape and shepherd you in Jesus Christ. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at Agape? You can visit us at agapekman.ky slash giving to see how you can do that. Again, we pray this blesses, encourages, and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. been in our series called Family Focus, and uh, that's where we've been for the last couple of weeks and where we're going to continue to be today uh, as we've been talking just about the importance of family and the importance not just of, of, of having a family, but the importance of having a healthy family. You know, God designed family, and when he designed it, he made it the way that he wanted it. He knows how it works best, and, and that's what we've been taking the time to examine and look at. What does the Word of God say to us about our families and about the way that we live and operate as parents, as husbands and wives, and all these different dynamics that come to play in our families. And so we started off by talking about how to build a lasting family and, and the importance behind building a lasting family. Then we talked about closing the gap last week and closing the gap in marriage to to, to fill in some of those gaps. As, and, and today, actually, we're going to be talking about how to fill the gap. And, and so, it, you know, it, the image that I kind of have in my mind as I think about this sermon is we're, we're rowing in a boat, and the boat has some holes in it, and we need to patch the holes. So how are we going to fill those gaps? How are we going to fill those, those holes so that the ship doesn't sink? And, and so for, for each of us, you know, even... If it's a small leak, if you leave a small leak long enough, guess what? It can still fill the entire boat. And, and so the goal and the idea this morning is to really look at how we can fill the gaps, fill the holes. We talked about closing the gap last week, and today we want to fill the gaps that exist there in our relationships and in our families. And so as we look this morning, we're going to talk about one of the most important ingredients to life. And if you've got your Bible with you, where we're going to be this morning is in the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 13. As a matter of fact, this morning, we're going to move through the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time today. And, uh, and if you've got your uh, Agape app, there's also the sermon notes available in the Agape app that you can follow along with as we've provided that for you. But there's one of, the most ingredient, one of the most important ingredients is love. One of the most important ingredients in life is to understand that love is an important part of everything. You know, if we love what we do, it makes a difference. If we love our spouse, if we love our children, if we love God, if we love our job, if we, we love our church, if we love our neighbor, if we love, it makes a huge difference in all of our lives. And the question for a lot of us is not whether love is important or not, 
Most people that you ask that question to will agree that love is important, but here's the reality, is that if we even did a survey in this room this morning, and I asked you, what were, how would you describe and define love, there would be some common things that we might all share, or some common things that a few of us might share, but the reality is, is that for most people, love means different things. Even when you read your Bible, when you read your Bible, the Bible wasn't written in English, obviously. The Bible was written in, in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And the thing about it is, is that in the Greek, which is predominantly what the New Testament is written in, there are more than one word for love. So for instance, if we say, I love you, I, who am I talking to? I could be talking to you as the church. I could be speaking to my wife. I could be speaking to my children. I, I could be speaking to a friend. I could be speaking to a parent or a grandparent. But here's the reality is that when I say I love you, in each of those circumstances, the love is different. My love for you as a church is different than my love for my wife. My love for my wife is different than my love for my children. My love for my children is different than my love for my parents. It, it, it varies across the board. And there's even within all those things, there are different types of love that we talk about. And so there's four basic words. We're not going to get into all of them, but one of them should be very familiar to us because it is the name of our church, the word agape. And the word agape is the, the Greek word for the love of God that is, is really, it's unfathomable. It, it's beyond comprehension. It's, it's a, a never-ending love that is unconditional. And we're going to be looking at that love this morning because I believe that regardless of any of the other types of love that we talk about, it must be first rooted in the love that we're going to be talking about here this morning, the agape love of God. Remember in Matthew chapter 22, as we looked at it, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 22 that the first and greatest commandment is that we should do what? Love the Lord our God. And the second, he says, is like it, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. And so if the first one is that we love God and the second one is that we love our neighbor, then all the love that we share with everyone, doesn't matter whether it's family, friends, strangers, church brothers and sisters, it all must first start of the love of God. That changes everything about the way then that we love. And 1 Corinthians 13 is written to a church that exists in the early church where they were in the city of Corinth and they were known as the Corinthians. And Paul is writing this letter to the church in Corinth, and he's dealing with a lot of issues, really, that the church in Corinth is dealing with. And one of the main issues that the church is really struggling with in Corinth is how do we love one another? And this is why Paul writes this letter. And so even though 1 Corinthians 13 gets read at a lot of weddings, uh, it's really not a wedding scripture per se. Because while it talks about love and the importance of love and how beautiful love is, it's really talking about the love that God has for his people. And so let's dive into to this today. We're going we're gonna to break down the entire chapter into 10 things this morning that love is about. And so we're gonna, I'm going to give you 10 points on love this morning about what love represents based off of this chapter. And so the first thing about love is that love is power. Power. So let's start reading 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am no, a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Now, these are powerful words coming from the Apostle Paul that, that really are sort of shocking to, to the, 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 the readers who are reading this, and it should shock you and I as well. He says, if you don't have love, you are nothing. That, that's, that's some pretty strong language. And what he's talking about here is something that's so critical and important. And, and we're going to jump into that for just a second, but... but what he's trying to get us to see is to differentiate between what a lot of times we miss. It's not that you just do something, it's the way that you do something. 
And so we talked last week about the wife who encourages her husband when he doesn't usually pray, but he prays over the dinner table, and he was so, she, she was just encouraging him in the Lord, and so he prayed, and even though it wasn't the most fantastic prayer, she encouraged him. He was speaking in tongues by Friday. I mean, everything was just, just going fantastic in their life and in their marriage, and even though all of that happens, Paul says, I don't care what gifts you have. I don't care what talents you have. I don't care if you can speak in tongues or prophesy. If you are missing love in your life, you're nothing. I even looked it up in the Greek. I was like, did he really mean like you're nothing if you don't have love? That's what he really means. If you don't have love, if you don't give love, he says you are nothing. And, and it's really something that should shock us as Christians because we go, well, who doesn't love? Who doesn't love? I mean, we, 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 there's at least, there should be at least one person in our lives that we love. Even the worst person on earth, we would imagine, has someone that they love, even if it's twisted. The reality is, is not whether we can define love in our terms, but the reality is, how do we define love according to God's terms? Because what Paul says is here, you know, you, you can look at some Christians and be like, man, they're so gifted. They're so blessed. They're, they're, I mean, they're, they're an incredible Christian. Look at how they, they, they can speak in tongues. I wish I could speak in tongues. They can prophesy. I wish I could prophesy. They can, they can heal the sick. They can raise the dead. They can do all these things. And Paul says, I don't care if they can do any of those things if they don't have love. And when he says if you don't have love, it's not that someone loves you. It's do you love others? And when this comes and we think about this, you know, we, we think about sort of the superpowered spiritual gifts, particularly in, 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 when it comes to tongues in church. You know, tongues is one of those things where it's like, man, like if you can speak in tongues, you're like a select group of individual elite Christians that if you can speak in tongues, you belong in the elite category. And we kind of have this idea of superpowered spiritual gifts. I was actually thinking about this when I was writing a sermon. Um, I was remembering, I don't know how, how many of you might remember this, but, but the cartoon that, that was around back in the day, Captain Planet. You know, and, and, and I was laughing because, and I, and I always laugh at this because I just find it hilarious. Here's all these people with superpowers, right? And this guy comes out and he's got wind power and this one's got earth power and, and this one's got fire and, this, and then this dude comes out heart. Like heart power? Like, uh, uh, this dude can move mountains and this one can conjure fire and this one can cause a storm and you've got heart power, but the reality is is that love is power. Love is power. It's not just powerful. It is power. See, it, it, and you don't, you don't raise your hand this morning, but, but think about this for a second. Do you speak in tongues? Let's, let's use tongues because tongues is kind of seen as the the ultimate gift. And I want you to just think about this this morning. Because there's a lot of Christians, possibly even some here this morning, who, who look at other Christians who speak in tongues and they're like, man, like, I, I wish I could speak in tongues. And I, and I feel like my salvation is missing something because I don't speak in tongues. And, and we look at that and we go, well, you know, we kind of, but, but Paul says, love is, uh, tongues is not the ultimate gift. And it's not that, that we shouldn't think about speaking in tongues or desire to speak in tongues, he says, we should. He says, I speak in tongues more than anybody. He says, I, I, I prophesy. For those of you who, who receive prophetic words, Paul says, is it a bad thing to receive and give prophecy? No, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is what is more important than whatever gifting you have is that what is more important for every Christian is that we have love in our lives. And as long as you have the love of God in your life, it doesn't matter whether or not you speak in tongues. It doesn't matter not whether you prophesy. What matters most of all is that you live according to the love that God has given to us and that you show others that love. That is a vital and critical part of the way we live. And then from there, whatever gifting you have flows out of that love that God has put into your life. And it works the same way in our family. Think about it this way. Love is so powerful that when it is missing from a home, it can destroy families. It does destroy families. But when it is present, it creates an environment for health and growth, 
Love has power behind it. It is not just something that is, is natural or emotional. It is something that is supernatural by the power of God. We search for it. We will fight for it. We will die for it. We will grow because of it. We will forgive the unforgivable because of love. And we will persevere through trial, trouble, tribulation, and storm all because of love. Love is power, not just powerful. Love is power. And this is what Paul wants us to see here about it. And then, then the second thing is that love is its own reward. Love is its own reward. Paul says, if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned and have not love, I gain nothing. So he moves from saying that I have nothing to being sort of the, the ultimate philanthropist in life, right? Like you think about people who, I mean, what do you get from giving away everything? Nothing. You don't, you don't get anything from that. Maybe some satisfaction that you help someone else, or, or maybe even, you know, maybe even, that, that, let's say that you do get something. They, they recognize you in some capacity. They build a statue to you because you gave away all your life's belongings to help this purpose or to build this cause or whatever it is. You, you give it all away for something else. Paul says, well, if you don't have love, if you don't give love, then you're nothing. And if you Give everything that you have away, and you don't do it with love. You gain nothing. You gain nothing. I mean, why would you give up everything? Why would you? I can't think of a greater reason than love. Look at, look at what God did. Why did God send Jesus? Jesus. One of, the, one of the most well-known scriptures in all the Bible is what? John 3, 16, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why would you give up everything? Why, why? some of you, some of you you, 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 you moved countries because of love. People have, have given up the opportunity for millions of dollars because of love. People have, have thrown away things in life that are so valuable and so important and so wonderful, and everyone would be scrambling at the opportunity for that, but for them, love was more important. Love is its own reward. And when we recognize this and when we recognize that we give it, we recognize that we are receiving a reward though we don't intend to. When we give love, we don't give love so that we might receive anything back. We give it just simply for the benefit of giving it. And Paul says that when we give it, if we give but we don't have love, he says then, then we gain nothing. You know, the early church, when you read the, the scriptures, the early church was in a practice of doing this where the church didn't have the kind of funding and resources that it has available to it now. And so in the early church, what happened was is that because there were smaller groups of people, the church was so invested in doing the work in the ministry of God that many of the people in the early church literally sold their homes, literally sold everything that they had. Some of them had farmland. Some of them owned cattle. Some of them, I almost said some of them owned cars. That would be interesting. Uh, but, but some of them owned lots of different things, businesses, stuff like that, and they sold it all for the purpose of resourcing the church. Now, how many of you knowing that uh, we need to raise some money for the roof are willing to sell your houses this morning? How many of you are willing to sell your cars and give all the money to the church? I, I, I don't see any hands. I'm a bit disappointed. No, I'm kidding. The reality is, is that the early church did this because of what? Their love. But who did they love? They loved Jesus. And because they loved Jesus so much, what the early church said was, you know what? We want to take what we have and we want to give it to the Lord. 
We want to give it to the mission of the church. We want to give it to the purpose of the church. So we want to help reach the lost, and we know that that takes finances and resources. Well, where are we going to sleep? The Lord will provide. Well, what are we going to eat? The Lord will provide. That was how the early church lived. And many of them, what they ended up doing was they ended up living with other believers who hadn't sold some of their stuff. And so you had people who were giving away everything, and then you had people who were giving a portion, and then you had people, like there's one couple, who who they take and they pretend to sell everything and pretend to give it away and pretend to be in the same sort of category because they want everyone to view them the way that everyone else sees. Because, hey, I mean, you got these people over here who are giving away everything, and then, hey, we want everybody to look at us the same way. And they were concerned about status more than they were concerned about their love for God. And what ends up happening is that both the husband and the wife end up dead because they were not only trying to fool the church and fool people, they were also trying to fool God. And both of them ended up dead because of this. And it's not because they weren't willing to give it up. It was because they were pretending to be people that they were not. And what love does for us is that love causes us to sacrifice for those whom we love, and it's its own reward in its own way. As parents, I mean, we sacrifice for our kids all the time, don't we? And, and at least I hope we don't complain about the sacrifices that we, that we make for our children because we chose to have them. And, and, and we, we, we make those sacrifices, and yeah, I mean, we might complain that life is hard or life is tough, but we shouldn't be looking at our kids and going, man, if I didn't have you, I, I, I could be living the dream right now. But you, you ruined it. Like, like I, if you did that, I hope you haven't done that. But, but that's not the kind of parents we want to be. That's not the kind of spouses we want to be. What we want is to be people who sacrifice for those whom we love. And the reality is, is what are we willing to give up for the people that we love? Love will cost you something. Jesus' love for us cost him his life. Love will cost you something. It will always cause you to, to give something up. And if you're not sacrificing, then the reality that you need to ask yourself is, am I truly loving? If I'm not sacrificing, if I'm not giving sacrificially to those whom I love, then am I truly loving? Because what the next four verses are really going to show us is the way that love manifests itself. The way it manifests itself in the life of a believer. Because I want you to remember something, that, that the way that things are for the world are not the way that things are for the church. There's a difference between the world and the church. Because in the church, we have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. The Bible says that there are things that are of God that are foolishness to the world, and the world will not understand them because they don't have the Spirit of God. And so what is happening next, while I agree that everyone will agree with what it talks about next, not all of us live it. And the reason why is because it's impossible to live this without God leading you and guiding you. Because this is perfect love. And so what the next four verses are going to be showing us is is how love manifests in the life of the believer and in the home of the believer. And it also shows us that love is the defining characteristic of God's presence in his people. And it should be the defining characteristic in the life of the believer. And so as we look at this here, we want to be a people that are defined by God's love, by our love for others and our love for God. And so the third thing that is that love is patient, kind, and humble. It's patient, kind, and humble. Beginning in verse 4, Paul says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. And so, so here he is giving us some definitions of what love is actually is. Paul didn't give us some nice, beautiful poetry to say roses are red, violets are blue, whatever. (laughs) I couldn't think of anything else. He didn't give us some nice poetry. 
he actually takes the time to put a definition here for us. To say to us, this is what love is. And when we recognize that this is what love is, and remember, it's not just any kind of love. It's the love of God, but it's the love of God for us that should be reflected from us onto others. And so love is patient, love is kind, it, 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 it's, it's humble. If you're patient this morning, can I just ask you to raise your hand wherever you are? Praise the Lord. How do you do it? I, I, I'm being serious. How do you do it? Because, I, I mean, I love you. God bless you. Thank you for being honest that you're a very patient person because I, I, I don't understand patient people. Not because you're not fantastic people. You are. I'm just not that patient. And I don't always understand how to be patient. And, 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 and sometimes in my frustrations, I, I look at my wife sometimes and she's like, calm down. And she's giving me the eyes and I know what it means. She's like, calm down. There's no reason to be frustrated right now. Just be calm, be patient. And I'm like, I don't want to be patient right now. And I'm, <laughs> be patient. Shh. So, so we, we, like I had to start counting. I had to start, you know, counting from 10. You know, sometimes like when, when the kids get in trouble with something, they think I'm counting for them. I'm like one, two, three, four, five. And they're looking at me and they're like, am I going to be in trouble when he reaches to what number? And I'm not counting for them. I'm counting for me because I'm trying to calm down because I'm frustrated. And, 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 but the Bible says that love is patient. It didn't say love is trying to be patient. It says love is patient. It is. It says it's, love is not trying to be kind. Love is kind. It didn't say that love was, was going to be proud and boastful. No, it said that love is humble. That's how it defines it. It doesn't say it's trying to be. It says it is that. And so when we read this, patience isn't easy. Can I just see the hands of all the impatient people in the room? Praise God, we're in the same category. Thanks for joining me on the boat. So what is patience? Patience is this. Patience is to endure without getting angry. It means to have, think of, remember, like, uh, it's been a while, but remember firecrackers? It literally, this, when it says to be patient, it literally means to have a long fuse. And so as a kid, we would always get firecrackers and you'd, you'd pull one off and we, would, we, we were kind of dunce. So we would make the, sh the fuse as short as possible to see who could throw the firecracker without it popping in your hand. And so we would, we would take it and we would, we would light the fuse. And of course, what happened more often than not? It blew up in your hand. What patience is, is literally having a long fuse so that it takes a long time before it explodes. That's what patience literally means. That's what it's talking about here. But it, it goes beyond this because what it actually means is, and this, 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 this really blew my mind here, what it actually means is to have a passion for God's timing. Now when I read this, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by this. I'm like, wait, what? Here's what it means. I can be patient because I know God is working. Can I say that for you again? I can be patient because I know God is working. See, see, I'm not patient because of anything else. I'm patient because I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm trusting in God. I know that God has the best for me. I know that the Lord loves me. I know that God is for me. Therefore, I will be patient. Because what does love really do? What does being patient in love really do? Love waits patiently on its beloved. That's what it does. And all the men in the room said, amen, I'm always waiting on my wife for something. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't want to get anybody in trouble this morning, including myself, my wife said. <laughs> but it says love is kind. What does that mean? It means I'm willing to help. So, so something goes on, hey, how can I help you? 
Something's happening. How can I be of service to you? Lo- being kind means I'm going to take my time with you. It, 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 it actually flows very well. Because I'm patient, I'm also kind in the process. So I want to know how can I take my time with you to help you understand, to help you learn. Think of it this way. Love, uh, being kind, think of it as sweetness. Because that's actually what the word means. It means sweetness. And, and so you just take the time and the opportunity to be sweet to the, those who you love. So maybe for those, the people that you love, it's, it being sweet is, is saying something kind, being there to help them, being gentle with them, to, to, to maybe hug them or kiss them. That's what it means to be kind, to be sweet to them. You know, we know people like that. that, that that's how we describe them, right? That they're just a sweet person. They have a sweet personality. And, and that is what this is talking about. That's love. Then he says that love does not envy. Now, envy, envy begins when admiration and desire turn to resentment of others and what they have. Now, that doesn't always mean that it's something physical that someone has. But, but, but envy is, look at what they have, I wish I had that too. So here's what envy is sometimes. Envy sometimes is this, I'm glad you have time to sit down and watch TV. I'm glad that, 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 that you think that, that the house cleans itself. I'm, I'm glad that, that, and it's this sarcasm that comes along with it. It's like, I, 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 I wish I could just do that. I wish I had money to just go and wash my hair every weekend and go get my nails done all the time or, or to buy new clothes and shoes or to get a new car. Sometimes that's how envy shows itself. And it shows up that way in marriage. It shows up that way in parenting. It shows up that way in church. It shows up that way in lots of different ways. Where sometimes envy isn't, isn't that we're looking at someone else and going, man, I wish I had what they had, and man, I would kill to get it. Sometimes envy is just, I wish I could do that. Where they getting the money from to do that? Where they get the time from to do that? What, what going on in their life that they can afford that, but I can't? And what you do is, is that what ends up happening, and this happens in marriage as well, where we begrudge someone for status and honor that they have. It happens in our workplaces, and so somebody gets a promotion. Hmm, that should have been mine. Well, I, I, I basically work in a job of three people. Now, I'm not saying that that's not true. But, but you're looking at what somebody else is, is getting and because they have received that and it works that way in marriage. Again, that some, like, like you all know this in, in parenting. Sometimes it seems like one parent is the favorite parent, doesn't it? Like, yeah, I'm envious of that. But the Bible says that love does not envy. It says it doesn't envy. Sometimes we even get envious of our kids. That we look at where our kids are at and what our kids have accomplished and, and what they've done, and we know that we've worked 10 times as hard as they have, but look at what they have at, at half our age. It happens. But the reality is, is that when we love, we do not envy. We, we, we don't give in to envy. And it says then that love doesn't boast. What it's, what it's saying here is don't inflate your importance. So it, it's like saying this, you would be nothing without me. It's like looking at your kids and saying, oh, you think you're hot stuff, huh? Well, well, well guess what? Without me, where would you be? You can go live on the street. It's like looking at a spouse and saying to them, you know what? If I leave, all of this is gone. You're nothing without me. You, you think you're going to get that job, that promote? If I didn't give you, if I didn't tell you what to do, you wouldn't be anything. Thinking that you are, that the world revolves around you. And that if you weren't there, that if you weren't around, then that means that guess what? Their lives would be garbage. That's what boasting is about. Thinking that you are more important than you really are. And then it says, love isn't rude. 
This means basically this, have good manners. Like to the point of literally the, the definition of, of, of not being rude, the opposite of this is basically this, say thank you, say please, say you're welcome, open a door, show good conduct. That's literally what it means. Things as simple as that. You know, sometimes we feel entitled to things. And so someone does something for us and we don't even bother to say thank you. But what, what Paul is trying to get us to see here is this, is that, is that that's rude. That's not love. If somebody picks up your plate and carries it to the kitchen, thank you. And the other person says, you're welcome. Not in a, in this really like proud sort of way, but, but because you are doing something, he's, he's piggybacking off of what he just said, that love is both patient and kind. So the, the, the kindness is the opposite of the rudeness. In Ephesians chapter four, verse one to three, it says, I therefore urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. What he's saying is this, is that when we live this out, that it actually shows our calling and our walk and our election with God. That it actually proves that we are Christians that it actually shows that we love Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that we actually follow with the Lord through life, not just in a church service. It's easy to do that. Listen, it's easy to be a Christian at church because it's easy to sing the song and it's easy to listen to the sermon and then you go home, turn to life as it was. But to live for Christ, he's saying, listen, I'm urging you to walk in a manner that is worthy of the call that is on your life. So when you are with your family, then guess what? You're living out your faith in God. That when you're with your friends, that you're living out your faith in God. That when you're with your children, that you're living out your faith in God. Because love is patient, kind, and humble. And it remains that way. And when we, when we are patient, humble, and kind, it shows, it actually shows that we truly, genuinely love the Lord and love our families. See, we can, we can feel frustrated, but we don't have to respond in frustration. We can, be, we can choose to be patient even though we feel frustrated. Patience isn't just remaining calm or learning to stay calm from the perspective of that you don't feel on the inside. I mean, impatient people, you all understand what I'm saying? Where you feel that bubbling inside, it's like, ooh, I want to say something so bad right now. I want to say something, I want to tell somebody something, I want to say something, they are wrong. That is incorrect. Like, I'm 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 ready to, to say it, but instead, what do you do? You exercise patience. And by exercising patience, you choose not to do that. But here's the fourth thing that love is. Love is cooperative. So Paul says it this way. He says, it does not insist on its own way. In 1 Corinthians 13, 5. It does not insist on its own way. See, relationships are not about us getting our way. When you're married, are you married to yourself? No, you're married to somebody else. And guess what? The husband is the head, right? The wife must respect her husband, right? But does that mean that the husband makes all the decisions and he tells everybody what to do and if you don't listen to me, you are a bunch of heathens in this house? No, that's not what that means. What that means, as a matter of fact, more than anything, is that what the husband does is lay his life down for his family, and what the wife does is she respects that laying down of that life. She respects the fact of the the sacrifice that he is making because relationships are not about getting your way. And if you went into a relationship thinking, this person's here to just do everything I want and wait on me hand and foot, 
guess what? You're in the wrong relationship because that's not what relationships are about. Friendships aren't that way. Marriages aren't that way. The relationship that you have with God is not that way. The relationship you have with your kids are not that way. But does that mean? For instance, when we look at our kids, some of us give chores to our kids, for instance, because we don't want to do the chores. <laughs> so you wash the dishes. Well, why don't you wash it? No, you wash the dishes. I washed the dishes for the last 30 something years or 40 something years, or however long it's been for you. You can wash the dishes. You, don't, you give them the responsibility because why? Because I don't feel like doing it. That's not the way that we, we give responsibility. We give responsibility because we want them to learn something in the process. And, and so while they may not want to do it, and hey, we may not want to do it either. But we don't give responsibility away in a relationship because we don't feel like it. So when I don't feel like getting my own dishes or washing my own dishes or or taking off my own shoes, and I say to you, hey, come here, get the shoes off my feet. Well, when we say it like that, it's a problem, right? It works the same way with our kids too. It works the same way with our kids, too. It works the same way in our relationships with one another. That, that when we love, we cooperate together. Why? Because, hey, I, wanna, I want you to wash the dishes. And as a, but as a parent, you say to your kids, hey, I want you to wash the dishes. Why? Because I want you to learn some responsibility. Not, I don't feel like washing the dishes. You do it. Not, you look at your spouse and say, take my shoes off. Because I don't feel like taking my shoes off. I've been, I've been at work all day. Here you go. It doesn't work that way. It's about cooperating together, about working together. And, and, and let me just say something. When I say cooperation, I don't mean compromise. Compromise is not as good as a lot of people say. Marriage is about compromise. I don't believe marriage is about compromise. Here's the reason why. is because compromise usually leaves us with the feeling that we have been rejected and that our ideas and our thoughts are not good. And so we come to a discussion about something and we go, well, here's what I think we should do. No, I, think that, I don't think we should do that at all. Okay, well, then let's just do what you want to do. And now it's like, all right, well, I guess they don't really care what I have to say. Compromise is not a good thing. Why? Because the intention behind a marriage is not that I'm going to get my way and I'm going to do what I want and you're going to listen to me because I'm going to insist that it's done my way. No. What it says is, hey, we're going to work together. We're going to work together. What is the best thing for our family? That's what we're going to come to terms with. Not what I think. Let's come to terms with what we think. Let's let's talk about how do you feel about this? How do I feel about this? And, and you know, uh, for Emily and I, this has often worked out in ways where neither Emily nor I get what we want. I come thinking, hey, I think we should do B, A. And Emily comes and says, I think we should do B. And we end up doing C. Because after discussing and talking about the pros and cons and going back and forth, we realized that the way I wanted it wasn't going to work. The way she wanted it wasn't going to work. But the way that we both came to agreement would work. See, it's working together. It isn't about compromise. It's about working together. Because what ends up happening in that situation is you both end up feeling heard even if you don't go along with what happens. Because what he's trying to get us to see here is this. You are seeking the interest of the other person. You are seeking the interest of the other person. You're not telling them what is in their best interest. You are seeking what is for their best. And so that's why the Bible says, husbands, love your wives. Because that's what's best for the wife. What does the Bible say to the wives? Wives, respect your husbands. And then guess what? It goes even further than that. What does it say? Children, obey your parents. Because you see, in a marriage, a husband loving a wife and a wife respecting her husband helps to make a good marriage. And also when they have kids, that children obeying their parents 
mother and father who are married together in the confines of marriage. This is what he's talking about, husband and wife. He says, when this happens, what happens? He says, then the, the family can be healthy. Then the family can move forward. So he says, husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Children, obey your parents. And this brings about cooperation in the family. And this even happens sexually. So when it happens this way, that you, you insist on having your way, and this goes on both ends, well, I just don't feel like doing it tonight. Well, I want to do it. Well, now there's a conflict. Now there's an issue. Now there's a problem. And guess what? Each one is insisting on their own way. And again, it's not working together because what oftentimes ends up happening in a situation like that is what? One or both end up frustrated. Rather than working together and then one thinks, well, it's all about what I want. It's all about my desires and you're not considering the way that I feel and you're not thinking about what I want and my desires and and what's going on in my life. And you know where this actually comes from? This actually comes out of Greek mythology. And going back to the time, and this was one of the things that the church in Corinth was dealing with at the time, because one of the one of the uh, one of the most recognizable symbols around the world for love is a chunky little baby with a bow and arrow who shoots people, and what do they do? They fall in love, right? Well, here's the thing: if you've ever paid attention to any of the the mythology and any of the signs and symbols around Cupid and the way Cupid works. You know how Cupid works? Cunningly and seductively. And so Cupid runs around sort of behind the scenes and he's sort of sniping people from behind the scenes into them basically falling in love, right? But here's the thing, is that he's using a bow and arrow and and the reality behind this is is that when it shows love through the perspective of bows and arrows, what it shows is that it shows a clever hunter who is striking in the unknown. That's what, it, that's what it, it's meant to portray. And so what ends up happening is, is, that, is that you've got this mentality and this idea that love is war, and it should never be. Love was never meant to be war. Love was never meant to be about a fight. Love was never meant to be about striking in the unknown. Jesus said, there's no greater love than this, than that you lay down your life for your friends, that you lay down your life for the people that you love. He says it's not about war. It's not about you getting your way. It's not about me insisting that it's done my way. No, no, it's about laying down your life for others, for those whom you love. And that's what Jesus showed us. That's what he showed us at the cross, that he died for us and that he, he laid his life down for us because of his love for us. And then the fifth thing is that love is gracious instead of frustrated. So Paul continues and he says in verse 5, he says, love is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Now when he says that love is not irritable, what he means is that it doesn't feel provoked. You don't feel provoked. You don't feel irritated. So for instance, there's just some people who the minute they say anything to us, we go, oh, you again. The minute you see them coming, They don't even say anything to you yet. You just see them coming. You start feeling irritated. You start getting hot flashes. Your body temperature starts heating up. They better not come say nothing to me. You all know exactly what I'm talking about. You're frustrated and nothing's even happened yet. Why? Because there's a preconceived, you're offended before there's even a reason to be offended. This is what he's talking about here. That love is not irritable or resentful. What do they want now? What are they asking for me for? And what it is, it is a prepared response that you are ready to overreact. Isn't that interesting? 
you're ready to overreact in a situation. So, so somebody calls you and they say, hey, uh, I need to talk to you. Oh, dear Lord. Mm-hmm. What do they want now? And you're, you're ready. You're already offended. They haven't even given you a reason to be offended yet, but you're already offended. You're already irritated. You're already upset. And then you preconceive an overreaction, and then you overreact because of it. And then you justify the overreaction because, well, see, I knew they were coming with some foolishness. And what it shows, Paul says, is that you're wrapped up in your own feelings, that you can't get around that. And what it leads to is resentment. And he says, resentment is this. When you resent them, it says, it's not looking for an opportunity for revenge or to count something against the other person. So he says, when love is not resentful, that that, that, that love, it means that you're not looking for that opportunity to be offended. You're not looking for that opportunity for revenge. You're not looking for that opportunity to be upset or irritated by them. You're not keeping score. As a matter of fact, let me just tell you, keeping score never helps you to win. It always helps you to lose. In a marriage, when you can't forgive and you're, you're well, you remember when, guess what? You just lost that match. Because even if you win the argument, you lost the fight. Even if you win the argument, the relationship has been suffered because doing that is like taking a knife and just stabbing someone. Because that's what resentment does. It keeps score of all the hurt, of all the pain, and it only causes more. And it never makes you win. It always makes you lose. But patience, as we talked about earlier, patience is key to this. And not insisting that you get your own way is also key to this. Because what we do is, is instead of doing that, we put the needs of others first. You know, if we, if we looked at marriage in this way, we looked at our relationships in general in this way, what can I do to serve you? You know, everybody's needs would be met. Because if I'm thinking about how to serve you and you're thinking about how to serve me, guess what? You're serving me and I'm serving you, and guess what? Both of our needs are met. But the reality is, is that when we start thinking just about how to serve ourselves, then what comes in is irritation, what comes in is resentment, what comes in is that, 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 that we look at, at the wrongdoing that someone else does and, and we get bitter about it. When Paul talks about wrongdoing, what he means there is actually iniquity, injustice, manipulation to take advantage of, to hide the truth. And t- but I don't, I, I, I'm not going to tell them the truth about this. I, I, I'm not going to tell them what really happened. I'm going to make up some story and I'm going I'm to just tell them a part of it. I'll just, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give them. You know, the best lies are all, always the ones that have a little bit of truth in them. They're always based on truth, but you just change one detail. And when you only change that sort of one detail, it makes all the difference in the world. And then they don't get as upset about it or they don't feel as bad about it. But this is what Paul is talking about. He says it does not rejoice at the wrongdoing. It rejoices in the truth. It takes pleasure in the truth. Because when we, when we do that wrongdoing, that iniquity, that sin, that injustice, that manipulation, he says that's not love. You're not loving anyone when you manipulate them. You're not loving anyone when you manipulate them. In 1 Timothy 5.8, Paul says this, but if anyone does not provide for his own relatives, and especially for members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So what is he saying? It's important that we take care of our family and that as we do so, we do love and with patience and with kindness and all these different things that come into play here. When he says that the truth It rejoices with truth. What he's talking about is goodness, speaking well of the other person and no exaggeration. So we've got some people that we just exaggerate about, right? Like, oh, yeah, I met met Andrew and he's nice. Oh, yeah, he's nice, all right. I I, I met so-and-so and, and and you know, they were telling me all about what happened. And, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure they did. 
There's this exaggeration that's in there about the person. You know, you, you, you look at them and you'd be like, oh, you're so beautiful. Mm-hmm. There's an exaggeration that's in there that, that, that's really meant to harm instead of heal and build up. And the sixth thing is that love remains. In verse 7, Paul says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. What he's saying here is this. There is nothing that love cannot face. There's nothing that love cannot face. That there is no limit to the faith of love. That there is no limit to its hope and to its endurance. It bears everything. It believes everything. It hopes everything. It endures everything. Think about it this way. When you love someone and they tell you something, if you really love them, most often times you don't think about what they've said to you. You just, you just accept what they've said because you love them and you expect them to tell you the truth. Then think about it this way. You ever seen, uh, you know, on, uh, like those, those crime shows and stuff like that that are based off of reality and they're showing you like, like the conversations and interviews that they had with people and there's always like a mother. This guy killed like six people. Oh, there's always a mother who's always there. He's such a good boy. He killed six people, but he's such a good boy. Why? Because what love does is that even in the worst of circumstances, it wants to believe the best. What love does, and this is why people say that love is blind, but, but it's not so much that love is blind. It's that love wants to believe the best about those whom it loves. Because for those of us with children, how many of us want to look at our kids and be like, man, you're just an evil, stinking thing? We don't want to do that, or at least you shouldn't do that. We want to look at our kids and say, man, like, you are such an incredible blessing. And I love you, and you're amazing. I mean, when you hold that baby in your arms for the first time, you're looking at it, and you're like, man, you are going to be so much trouble. No. You're just so excited to hold that child in your arms for the first time and just be like, I I just want to give you everything I possibly can. I want the best for you. I love you so much. Even just in those first few moments, you feel that. But love is not weakness. What love is, is love is the strength to remain through everything. Love is the strength to remain through everything. Let me tell you something. There'll always be a reason to quit. There'll always be a reason you feel like quitting. Think about mothers. You know, in, in, in most situations that I hear of mothers who, who are in labor, they, they get to a point where they feel like quitting. You know, I heard, heard many mothers talk about when they were in labor and they were giving birth to their child, and they're pushing, and, and they're going, and, and they're, they're in pain, and they're struggling, and they're having a hard time, and they say, I can't do this anymore. I can't feel, I, I, I don't want to do this. It hurts too much. It's this, it's that. And they just, they're, they're ready to give up, but they don't. They keep pushing anyway. They keep going. Why? Because they don't have a choice, but also because they know what's coming. And they keep going and they keep pushing and they push hard and they they, they keep fighting. Why? Because of love. And when we love, we keep doing it. And that's why Paul says that love bears and believes, it perseveres in faith. That's why he says that it hopes and endures, that it chooses to believe the best about others and hope the best for them. You can't say you love me and then turn around and say, man, I hope you get hit by a car today. Man, I, I hope that falls apart for you. Man, I, I, I can't wait to hear the bad thing that has happened because it is no, love doesn't just believe the best, it hopes for the best for others. That's why Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 8, he says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. What he means here is this, is that love has an incredible ability to forgive. You ever notice that there's just some people that just, they don't deserve your forgiveness, but you give it anyway. They've done something incredibly horrible to you. They've done something harsh to you, and you don't feel like forgiving, but you forgive out of love. You even feel stupid for forgiving them sometimes. Like, like, how could I be so foolish? 
Even in certain circumstances where, where it's like, like, I forgave them of this already and look at what they went and did again. They went and did it again. And you feel even more foolish. But yet, what love chooses to do is love chooses to say, you know what? It's not that love is, is foolish. It's that what love says is I want to cover this sinfulness with love, which is what God does with us. He looks at, does, does God know that you're going to sin again before you see him in eternity? Yeah. yeah, he does. But what does he do? He covers it in love. The, the psalmist says that his banner over us is love. What God is doing is that he's loving us through our sinfulness. Not that he's looking at us and going, yeah, just, just go ahead. You want to keep sinning? Go on. That's not what he's doing. But what he does is that he chooses to love us through those situations and circumstances. He chooses to cover those things in his love and forgive them. That's why the psalmist says that he removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. How far is the east from the west? Perpetually distant. Because as far as you go east, there's further west to go. I don't mean how far is west, be from east end. How far is the east from the west? If you got in a car and you could just keep driving for as long as there was earth, then guess what? You would just keep going east, east, east. And guess what? You'd still be going east for as long as you go east. And if you got and you did west, it would be the same thing. And God is removing it away. And then seventh, love is eternal. It says, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Some of your Bibles say this here, love never fails. What it literally means here is that love is eternal. It's constant. You know that when we go to heaven, we won't be speaking in tongues? When we go to heaven, we won't be prophesying. When we go to heaven, we won't be laying hands on nobody and praying for healing for them. When we go to heaven, guess what? We, none of those things will be around anymore, but you know what will be there? Love. You know what existed in the beginning with God? Love, because God is love. Therefore, it was with God in the beginning. And guess what? When heaven and earth pass away and all things become new, you know what's going to exist then? Because God is eternal, so is love, because God is love. And the gifts are going to fall apart. Literally what Paul means when he says this, there's, 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 there's a specificity that's within the Greek and the, uh, of what he's saying here. And he's basically making such a bold statement that he's saying the stars could literally fall from heaven and love would still remain. That's literally what he's trying to get across to us here. Love never ends. It never fails. It never ceases. It never stops. It just keeps going and going and going and going. Because that is who God is. That's why in Jeremiah 31, 3, it says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's, that's God speaking and telling us in Jeremiah 31, 3, that, that I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's his promise to us, that, that, that love is eternal. So it doesn't matter whether you go there, here, or over there. The psalmist says, even if I made my bed in hell, I still wouldn't be too far from your love because God's love is eternal and it goes everywhere. But love is a commitment. This is God's commitment to us. You see, none of us want to be loved in vain. Can you imagine somebody just say, I love you. I love you so much. You're, you're the most amazing thing. All right, let's get married. We get to the altar. And at the altar, you know what? I don't think I love you that much anymore. You know, I just kind of wanted to see how things would happen. Wait, what? Nobody wants that. What he's trying to say here is that this love is not based on whims, it's not based on feelings, it's not based on passing fancies or fantasy. Love is rock solid. It is eternal, it is intent, and it is meant to benefit the one that is loved. So when you say to someone, I love you, here's what Paul says you're saying. You're saying, I want to love you for eternity. That's not just in marriage, by the way. 
That's to your kids. That's to your spouse. That's to your friends. That's to your parents. He says if you love, he says that love is meant to be eternal, which means that when Jesus says love your enemies, guess what? That means you're going to be loving your enemy for all eternity. It isn't just a once-off. He says you better love them because guess what? That's what Jesus did with us. That while we were still his enemy, that he loved us and he died for us. And so if he can love his enemy for all eternity, so too will we be required to do the same. And when it comes to our families, that we love them and we fill our holes in our lives and our families with this kind of love. Number eight, love matures. Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. He says, love matures. And the maturing of love doesn't mean that we become sort of old, shriveled up, no fun, no nothing. What he means, no joy. What he means is that the relationship has depth. That it has depth. For those of you who have children who are older, many of you, I've heard many of you talk about how the relationship that you have with your children now is so much deeper and greater that, that your children have even become, even though they're still your children, and you will still remind them that you will knock them back to last week, you also say we have a great relationship. That we're, we're friends, we can talk about things. When we grow and we mature, relationships have depth. We can talk about the deep things, but we can also laugh about the foolishness. That there's depth to it there. We talk about your day, your dreams, your hopes, your visions, your, your, your feelings, the, the, your relationship with God, the vision you have for your life and for your family. And, and when you do that, when you have those conversations and you do those things together, your love matures. And then ninth, love persists through the unknown. Paul says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. You know, back in, in, in the day, they didn't have mirrors like we have today. Their mirrors were made literally from bronze. And so some of us had full-length mirrors that we got up and we looked in this morning. We checked and we, we looked and we, we fancied and we, we did everything that we needed to do to make sure we were well put together and kept in order. They couldn't really do that back in their day. They didn't have mirrors like we have. They would have literally these massive bronze reflective surfaces and they would stand in front of it and they would look into it but you would never have a clear good picture like what we have today they didn't have phones that someone could take a picture and then you can look at it and be like oh i don't like the way this looks it was a it was a a, a, a mirror that that gave a vague image of what they looked like and what paul says like that love looks into a future that it does not know and it says i'm willing to stay Think about your marriage vows, for instance. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, all these different things. Well, guess what? Everyone says those words, and they never mean sickness. They never mean poorer. They never mean worse. They always mean for better. They always mean for richer. And they always mean for health. But then sickness comes. A lost job comes. A situation you weren't expecting comes up. And what love does is love says, just like I made that promise to you back then, we're going to persist through these unknowns now. That's what love does. It says, I don't know what the future holds, but I know I'm here. And then 10, love is just the greatest. It's the greatest. Paul says, so now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Let me tell you something. You might not be the smartest person. You might not be the wisest or the richest. You mightn't be the greatest prayer warrior or leader that ever existed. You might not ever heal someone who you pray for or cast out a demon out of somebody. You may not be the greatest Bible scholar. You may not be the next Billy Graham. 
But here's what I know. If you love Jesus, if you love your friends, if you love your family, if you love your strangers, if you love the poor, if you love your spouse, if you love your enemies, you are doing the greatest thing you could possibly ever do. Because love is the greatest of all these things. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this message this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father God, for what you've said to us today as you've challenged us, Lord, to step out of our comfort zones, to step out of, Father God, the, 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 the way that we tend to think about things and think about life, think about our relationships. And Lord, I just pray today that you would teach us to love because love isn't just about how we feel. Far more than the way that we feel, love is about our actions. It's about the things that we do. It's about the way that we treat one another. Because Lord, love isn't on just simply an emotion we feel. It's a verb. It's something we do. And I pray that today you would help each of us, God, to live out love and to live out of love. That everyone we, everyone that we have a relationship with, Lord, even, even those relationships that have been strained, that you would help us as believers, as Christians, to learn to live out the love that we have for you and direct it towards others. Lord, you've called us in love. You've saved us in love. And everything that we have from you today has been given to us because of your love. So Lord, I ask today, would you transform us as believers, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, that we might walk in the very love of God, that agape love that, Lord, is so transformational and so life-changing that we can't live without it. Help us today, Lord, to be different. Not just different because of actions, but different because of love. Help us to love those, Father, whom, whom we struggle to love. Bring healing, Lord, in those places where we're, we're having a hard time showing others that love. And give us your spirit because, Lord, one of the fruit of the spirit is love. Because, Lord, you said greater than faith and greater than hope is the love of God. That love that is eternal. And Lord, help us to persevere in that love today. That we might know you, Jesus, greater than we ever have before. If you're here this morning and, and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're not living in the love that he, that he died to give you. And now is that opportunity, now is that day where you can make that change, where you can receive the love of God like you never have before. And if that's you this morning, would you just pray with me right now, a prayer of repentance and salvation to receive Jesus as both your Lord and Savior, but also the lover of your soul. Let's just pray right now if, if, if that's you and just say, Jesus, I give my heart to you. I give my life to you and I ask you to save me and set me free that I might live for you all the days of my life. Forgive me of all my sin. Wash me and make me new. I surrender all that I am to you today. In Jesus' name, amen.